You are graduating from Sarah Lawrence, the quintessential liberal arts college, at an interesting moment in, in history. It's a time when the liberal arts are honestly not very cool. You know what you are supposed to do in America these days. You are supposed to study computer science, code at night, start a company, take it public, and get rich. Right? <laughs> If you really want to branch out and go crazy, you could major in mechanical engineering. <laughs> what you are not supposed to do is study the liberal arts. Now, this is not really a joke anymore. The governors of Texas, Florida, and North Carolina have all announced that they do not intend to spend any more taxpayer money subsidizing the liberal arts. Florida's governor, Rick Scott, says, is it in the vital interests of the state to have more anthropologists? I don't think so. Even President Obama recently urged students to keep in mind that a technical training would be far more valuable than a degree in art history. Majors like English that were once very popular, uh, the highly respected, I believe Barbara Walters' major, uh, are now in steep decline. Now, you know, I can understand these concerns about liberal arts because I grew up in India in the 1960s and 70s. A technical training was seen as the key to a good career. People who studied the liberal arts were either weird or dumb, or sadly they were women, because in those days the humanities were considered an appropriate training for an aspiring housewife, but not for a budding professional. Now, if you were bright, you studied science, so I did. I, I even learned computer programming in India in the 1970s. Not very relevant to computer programming today. <laughs> when I came to the United States for college, I brought with me this mindset. In my first year at Yale, I took a bunch of science and math courses, but I also took one course in the history of the Cold War. That woke me up and made me recognize what my real passion was. I dove into history and English and politics and economics and have stayed immersed in them ever since. Now, in thinking about my own path, I, I hope to give you some sense of what the value of a liberal education is. But first, a point of clarification. A liberal education has nothing to do with liberal in the left-right sense of the word. It also does not ignore the sciences. From the time of the Greeks, physics and biology and mathematics yes. have been integral, <laughs> absolutely integral, to a liberal education, just as much as history and literature. For my own part, I've kept alive my own interest in science and mathematics. A liberal education, and this was Cardinal Newman's definition in 1854, is a broad exposure to the outlines of knowledge for its own sake, rather than to acquire skills to practice a trade or do a job. And there were, <laughs> there were critics even then. Cardinal Newman says people ask, to what does it lead? Where does it end? How does it profit? Oh, I remember the, the president of Yale when I was there, the, the late great Bart Jamadi, asked in one of his beautiful lectures, what is the earthly use of a liberal education? Well, I could point out that a degree in art history or anthropology often requires the serious study of several languages and cultures, an ability to work in foreign countries, an eye for aesthetics, and a commitment to hard work, all of which might be useful in any number of professions in today's globalized world. I might also point out to Governor Scott that it could be in the vital interests of his state in particular to have on hand a few anthropologists to tell Floridians a few things about the other 99.5% of humanity and how they live. But, but for me, for me, the most important earthly use of a liberal education is that it teaches you how to write. In my first year in college, I took an English composition course. I, I, my teacher was an elderly Englishman with a sharp wit and an even sharper red pencil, and he was, <laughs> he was tough. I realized that coming from India, I was pretty good at taking tests, at regurgitating stuff that I had memorized, not so good at expressing my own ideas. And over the course of that semester, I found myself beginning to make that connection between thought and word. I know I'm supposed to say that a liberal education teaches you how to think, but for me, thinking and writing are inextricably intertwined. The columnist Walter Lippmann was once asked what he thought about a particular topic. And he said, I, I don't know what I think about that one. I haven't written about it yet. <laughs> I find that when I start to write, my thoughts turn out to be 
a jumble of incoherent, half-baked impulses that have been strung together with lots of logical gaps. It is the act of writing that forces me to clarify them to figure out what I really think. And if you think this has no earthly use, just ask Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. Bezos insists that his senior executives write memos, often as long as six printed pages, and he begins senior management meetings with a period of quiet time, sometimes as long as 30 minutes, while everyone reads the memos and makes notes on them. Whatever you do in life, the ability to write clearly, cleanly, and I would add quickly, will prove to be an invaluable skill. And in many ways, that is the central teaching of a liberal education. The second great advantage of a liberal education is that it teaches you how to speak and speak your mind. Again, a big contrast between school in India and college in America was that I realized an important part of my grade was talking. My professors were going to judge me on the process of thinking through subject matter, presenting my analysis and conclusions out loud. The seminar, which is in many ways at the heart of a liberal education and at the heart of this college, teaches you that. It teaches you to read, analyze, but articulate. And being articulate is reinforced in the many extracurricular activities that surround every liberal arts college. Theater, debate, political unions, student uh, government, even protest groups. Right? You have to get people's attention and convince them of your cause. Speaking clearly and concisely is a big advantage in life. You have all surely noticed that when somebody from Britain gets up and talks in class, he gets five extra points, right? <laughs> in fact, British education and British life have long emphasized and taught public speaking through a grand tradition of poetry recitals, uh, elocution, debate, declamation. It all makes a difference. The accent helps too, of course. <laughs> The final strength of a liberal education is that it teaches you how to learn. I now realize that the most valuable thing I learned in college was not any specific set of facts or piece of knowledge, but rather how to acquire knowledge. I learned how to read an essay closely, find new sources, search for data to prove or disprove a hypothesis, figure out whether an author was trustworthy. I learned how to read a book fast and get, get its essence, an invaluable skill. And most of all, I learned that learning was a pleasure. It was an adventure. Whatever job you take, I guarantee you, the specific stuff you have learned at college, whatever it is, will prove mostly irrelevant or quickly irrelevant. Even if you learned to code, but did it a few years ago before the world of apps, you would have to learn anew. And given the pace of change that is transforming industries and professions these days, you need that skill of learning, relearning, and retooling all the time. So these are a liberal education strengths, and they will help you move through your working life. Of course, if you really want to be successful professionally, you will have to put in the hours, be focused, disciplined, work well with others, and most of all, get lucky. But you know what? That would be true for anyone, even engineers. <laughs> I kid you, of course. Remember, I'm from India. Some of my best friends are engineers. <laughs> But honestly, I think that the important thing we all have to recognize is that education is not a zero-sum game. Technical skills don't have to be praised at the expense of the humanities. Computer science is not better than art history. Society needs both, often in combination. If you don't believe me, believe Steve Jobs who said, it is in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It is technology married with liberal arts, married to the humanities that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. That marriage between technology and the liberal arts is now visible everywhere. 20 years ago, tech companies might have been industrial product manufacturers. Today, they have to be at the cutting edge of design, marketing, and social networking. Many other companies focus much of their attention on these fields because manufacturing is increasingly commoditized. And the value add is in the brand, how it is imagined, presented, sold, conceived, marketed. And then there is, of course, America's most influential industry, which exports its products around the world, entertainment, which is driven at its core by stories, pictures, and drawings. Did I mention that Juliana Margulies turned down a $27 million contract? And rumor has it that Barbara Walters has done all right. <laughs> you will notice that so far I have spoken about ways that a liberal education can get you a job. 
That is important, but it is not the only virtue. You need a good job, but you also need a good life. Reading a great novel, exploring a country's history, looking at great art and architecture, making the connection between math and music, all these are ways to enrich and ennoble your lives. In the decades to come, when you become a partner and then perhaps a parent, make friends, read a book, listen to music, watch a play, these experiences will be shaped and deepened by your years here. A liberal education also makes you a good citizen. The word liberal comes from the, word, from the Latin word liber, which means free. At its essence, a liberal education is an education to free the mind from dogma, from control, from constraints. It is an exercise in freedom. That's why the American founding fathers so be believed in it so passionately. Benjamin Franklin, the most practical of all the founders and a great inventor and entrepreneur in his own right, proposed a program of study for the University of Pennsylvania that is essentially a liberal arts education. Thomas Jefferson, in his epitaph, asked that it not be mentioned that he was president of the United States, but his epitaph proudly mentions that he founded the University of Virginia, another quint quintessential liberal arts college. Now, there is a calling even higher than citizenship that, the li that a liberal education prepares you for. Ultimately, a liberal education is about being human. More than 2,000 years ago, the great Roman lawyer, philosopher, uh, politician Cicero explained why it was important that we study for its own sake, not to acquire a skill or a trade, but as an end unto itself. We do it, he said, because that is what makes us human. It is in our nature that we are drawn to the pursuit of knowledge. It is what separates us from the animals. Ever since we rose out of the mud, we have been on a quest to unravel the mysteries of the universe and to search for truth and beauty. So as you go out into the world, don't let anyone make you feel stupid or indulgent in having pursued your passion and studied the liberal arts. You are heirs to one of the greatest traditions in human history, one that has uncovered the clockwork of the stars, created works of unimaginable beauty, and organized societies of amazing productivity. In continuing this tradition, you are strengthening the greatest experiment in social organization in the history of the world, democracy. And above all, you are feeding the most basic urge of the human spirit to know. How's that for a defense?